In this video, Jordan Peterson talks about why we need to honor our truth and he explains how to do it. But, um, so, it isn't that you're only going to find engagement in sheer physical productive activity. There's lots of places where you can be engaged. You can be engaged in art, you can be engaged in literature, you can be engaged in relationships, you can be engaged in your children. Like, there's no shortage of places of meaning. But you have to interact with those places of meaning properly. And you have to organize the multiple places where you derive meaning in a manner that's sustaining to all of them. And that's when you've got your frame right. But getting your frame right isn't enough. Because you have to get your frame right in a way that allows you to update your frame as you continue moving forward with it. And I do believe, because I do believe that the world that we're adapted to as biological organisms is the world where reality is information. I believe that when, when your nervous system signals to you that all's well, all's well. It's true. You're in the right place at the right time. You're bearing exactly the right amount of load. And the right amount of load is enough to keep you taut and ready and improving. And when you slip into that slot, I think all of the existential problems that, 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 that arise to push people towards nihilism and hopelessness, or, or sometimes towards totalitarian, totalitarianism and rigidity, that problem just goes away. And it's because you solved it. It's not because it's not a problem. It's a bloody problem. But that doesn't mean that, you know, because one of the things that modern people do is they conceptualize themselves as defeated a priori. You know, that the fact that life is tragic and that you're not all you could be and that everything will come to an end means that you're not, by definition, you're not up to the task. It's like, that's by no means obvious, man. People are tough. Like, they're so tough, it's unbelievable. Well, you know, you see that on YouTube. Because, you, you know, I look at YouTube now and then and you feel terrible about it. <laughs> <laughs> One of the things I do like looking at it are the extreme sports that people engage in. And I mean, people can do unbelievable things. They're completely, they're completely off the rocker. You know, they can do things with their bodies that you just can't possibly imagine. I was looking, for example, at there was a video that went around a while ago about it was a videotape of the woman who won the 1956 um, hurdling. You know, we bounce off our, uh, one of those um, horses for gymnastics, and so she did her winning routine. <clears throat> was videotaped, and then the next videotape was of the person who won the gold in the Olympics at the last Olympics, and it was like, the first woman did this really cool roll off the, off the horse, it was quite spectacular, it's like the second one was like 20 feet in the air with four flips, end over end, you know, vertically, it, it wasn't like, they were like, they weren't even the same creatures, one looked like some kind of, kind of like android kangaroo, and the other looked like a pretty competent gym teacher. <laughs> so, so, you know, I mean, God only knows what the limits of human ability are, but we certainly haven't touched them. And you guys, most of you, have no idea what you'd be capable of if you, like, if you really got your acts together, you know, when you were a force. Because another thing you might think about is, maybe the existential misery that you experience in your life is directly proportional to the amount of time you waste. Because if, if the dragon guards a treasure, you know, and your job is to get the damn treasure, and you need it, you need it, it's not, op it's not optional. Without the treasure, you don't have the riches necessary to live. All the time you're wasting is time that you're not spent in the treasure room, fundamentally. And so, you know, if you're not spending all your time in the treasure room, you can't complain about being poor. So it's a good thing to think about, you know, because it's, and this is what makes it optimistic, it's possible that if you utilize what was in front of you, and so that would be the ground of being, let's say, if you utilize that, that would be enough. Or maybe you could get even really lucky, and if you utilized it properly, it wouldn't just be enough, it would be more than enough, you know? So you could go from saying, well, it's okay to be a limited and mortal being, to saying, hey, this is a pretty damn good deal, and if I could, I'd sign on for it again. And that was actually Nietzsche's idea of the eternal return, you know? So when he was trying to figure out what people should do as a consequence of the collapse of the ethical system that constituted classical religious belief, he 
conjured up the idea of the eternal return. It was roughly this. You should live in such a way so that if you had to repeat what you were doing forever into infinity, you would say yes to that. And that's an, that's an idea like Piaget's equilibrated state, except obviously it's stretched into huge expanses of time. You know, that's a high-level thing to aim at, but... You know, so here's, here's another example. Like, I've seen people who, who get stuck in, in very bureaucratic organizations, you know, and they just get bloody well tortured to death by them because it's mindless tyranny, stupid rules, and, and on arbitrary decisions, and counterproductive management advice, and jealousy, and punishment for doing well, and, you know, everything you can do to possibly set up a situation where the person who's got the job is just crushed by it that people won't say anything. It's like, well, what would happen if you said something? Like, well, why do you want me to do this? It, it looks stupid. And they might be thinking, oh, I, I kind of thought it was stupid too, you know, but someone else told me to do it. Highly probable that they would be thinking that. It's like, what happens if you just refuse to do stupid, useless, meaning, meaningless things? It's like, that's a rule. I don't do stupid, <laughs> useless, meaningless things. Well, you know, one of the things that happens in corporations, and I've seen this happen many times, is that the corporation gets, it's like, a, it, it, it's like an elephant that gets loaded with intestinal parasites. And I, 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 mean that, I mean that as a biological analogy. I really do. Because a corporation is a body, in some sense, that has a tremendous amount of built-in value. And what can happen as the corporation develops is it gets full of people who just pull out the value. They don't actually do anything. They rape the brand is what they do. Because the brand has value, you know. Like the Disney brand has value because it's associated with quality. You know, and if you wanted to destroy that, you'd take over the company and you'd put out Snow White 2 and Snow White 3 and Snow White 5 and Snow White 12 until, and everybody would buy it until like Snow White 20 when they wouldn't trust you anymore and then you've sucked all the value out of the company and it's dead, you know. Or you get people who, who come into the corporation and all they want to do is maneuver up to the top. They don't give a damn about what the thing is supposed to be producing or about how they're structuring their relationships with other people or about anything that has to do with the truth. They use language instrumentally to reach their goals and you get enough people like that in your company, and it's like, it's dead. It's gone. And that happens to companies all the time, because they don't last, right? This is why Marx was wrong. You know, he said, power and money accumulate in the hands of fewer and fewer people. What he didn't say is it's always different people. You know, it's like there's a 1%, but it's not the same people. You know, most family and fortunes don't last three generations, and neither do most large companies. So there's a lot of dynamic turnover. But, you know, you guys are going to be working in companies, a lot of you, at, at, at least at some point, at pretty damn significant levels. And even at an entry level, you have more power than you think. You know, it is not necessary to do things you know are stupid and meaningless. And if, you're, if, if, if the situation that you're in is demanding that, then you might ask yourself, hmm, maybe I should be somewhere else. And then you might say, well, I can't be. And what I would say to that is, prepare yourself to be. Like, if you're going to go into a company, and you want to live ethically, you need an escape strategy, and you need to have that along with you all the time. So you need an updated resume, and you need to be keeping your damn eye on the job market, so that you can see where the other opportunities lie for you, and so you're not afraid to pursue them. You know, so you've got to hone your interview skills. You've got to keep your damn resume polished up. You've got to make sure you have a broad social network, and you have to do it consciously. And so that if some dingbat tells you to do something counterproductive, meaningless, and will push it one step farther, clearly unethical, you can say, no. And you can mean it, because no means I'm not doing that. And if you push me, we'll either have a war, or I'll go somewhere else. It's like, that's what no means. That, that's what it means. It means I'm not doing this. And you can't say no until you have an, an alternative, right? You have to set yourself up so that no doesn't kill you because obviously then you won't say it. 